Let's pray. Father, Lord, I pray you bless us now. Help us, Lord Jesus. Thank you for this Bible, Lord. Thank you for this King James Bible, the perfect, inspired, infallible Word of God. Lord, because it does, it does show us everything. It is all sufficient. It gives us everything that we possibly need and more. Lord, it explains everything. There isn't anything that you left out for us that we needed, Lord. And I thank you for that, Lord. And I pray that we, your people, would follow it, obey it, study it, learn it, love it, and live by it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse number 2. Before I get to this, I, I want to say this to you. You're told often, and, and there'll be a lot of people that will tell you, by the way, this is on the historical pagan origin of the Christmas tree. I might think of a better title later, but anyway, that's all I can think of right now. But... <clears throat> um, You've been told by a lot of people, well, the only verse in the Bible that people like to go to is, is Jeremiah, and they go to that, and there was no Christmas tree back then, and, and, and all this kind of stuff, and that's where they kind of go with that, okay? They kind of say that's the only verse. Well, I'm going to show you that that's a lie, okay? Because that's not the only verse, or either that may be not a lie, but they're very misinformed. That, that's not the only verse. So we're going to start this with a Bible study, all right? And I don't know how long this sermon's going to go. It may go an hour and a half. I'm not sure, but that's okay. You don't have anything better to do anyway. So, um, and that's what we're here for today. Amen. But I, I want to start with this Bible study here because I want to show you from God's holy word that trees were used for worship and God condemned it long ago. God has always condemned you taking something and using it to worship him. What did he say? Thou shalt have no gods before me, right? No other gods before me. What else did he say? Not to make of thee any graven image, right? Not to worship anything that what? That was, uh, isn't that Exodus chapter 20, correct? Exodus chapter, let's go to Exodus chapter 20. Let's look at that quickly here. I wasn't going to add that in, but why not? Let's do that, amen? Let's, let's use the exact words because God's holy word says it better than I could. So let's go there. Exodus chapter 20. And uh, let's read the command of God there. And by the way, did God repeal these commands? Are these, are these, are these commands about worshiping God? Can, are we allowed to worship God's, God any old way we want to? Is that, is that what we can do? Oh, we can just worship. Well, I feel like worshiping God with this tree right here is the way that I should worship God. And I don't think you should tell me or violate my conscience in any way by telling me that it's wrong for me to take a tree and worship God. Right? God knows my heart. Yeah, he does. He knows it's wicked and dirty and defiling. So don't use that argument, okay? Because that's a dumb argument. All right? Don't use that argument. But what does God say here in verse number 4? Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to, to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So God said, don't, you know, don't make any image. Don't fashion anything. All right. Don't fashion anything. Don't take anything out. Don't deck it with gold or silver. Don't do any of those things. Right. Don't do all that to worship me. Why? Because the Godhead can't be worshiped like that. Amen. God said not to worship him after that. Right. He can't be fat. You can't make an image of God. You can't make something to worship God with. All right. God said, you know, you call unto me and I will answer thee. Right? Worship him in spirit and in truth. Right. So, so God laid that down as a foundation in the scriptures long ago. I mean, you know, I don't know that anybody could really argue with that point. I mean, I guess they could try. Anybody that claims to be saved, though, should really argue with that. However, you're often told, though, that, well, Jeremiah is the only place that that's talked about. So, I mean, come on, don't you have any more? I mean, really? You think that's what he was really talking about? Well, yes, I do. Because, by the way, we're going to get to those verses, but it says the way of the heathen. It says the way, learn not the way of the heathen. Didn't even say that you were heathens, did it? In fact, he's talking to his people and he's telling them, don't learn the way of the heathen. Don't follow their ways. Don't try to worship me like the heathen worship. Don't try to do that. I won't accept that. Now, let's look at this, okay? So people will tell you, well, no, you know, trees, you know, whatever. Why do you make such a big deal about a tree? Well, God made a very big deal about trees, actually. So turn to Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse number 2, and we find here, You shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations which ye shall possess serve their gods. Well, where did they serve their gods? What did they use to serve their gods with? Upon the high mountains. So those are the high places, right? Upon the hills, right? And under what? Every green tree. Uh-oh. Every green tree. That's right. 
God said, if you see them doing that, you destroy that tree. You don't follow their ways. You burn it down, man. You cut it down. You destroy it. You don't have anything to do with that. But let's say you didn't destroy the tree. Let's look at it this way. You weren't supposed to worship under every green tree the way they did. You weren't supposed to use the tree in that way. By the way, I'm going to show you 14 instances in the, in the King James Bible uh, of, of green trees that were used for worship. By the way, did you know that in these 14 instances, which is the only time that word green tree is used, right? Every time it's condemned. It's a condemning thing. Every time God's against it. Every single time God is against it. God doesn't like it. God says, no, that's, the, that's what they did with their gods. I'm not like their gods. 1 Kings chapter 14, verse number 23. Oh, by the way, while you're turning there, uh, John Gill had this to say. He said, which being shady and solitary and pleasant to the sight, they fancied their gods delighted in it. And this notion prevailed among other nations. And there is scarcely, listen, any deity but what had some tree or another devoted to it. As the oak to Jupiter, the laurel to Apollo, the ivy to Bacchus, the olive to Minerva, the myrtle to Venus. They all had a deity attached to trees, a tree attached to a deity. All of them had one. All the false gods had that. Yeah, it'd be perfect, wouldn't it? Yeah, exactly. I know. And the star of Remphan, your God, and this, and, and then you have the others. Yeah, I mean, it's just perfect, isn't it? Isn't that unfortunate? Anyway, the first, yeah, first, first Kings chapter 14, verse number 23. For they also built them high places. Here we go. This, are you seeing how this is all pagan, false god worship? Look at this. For they also built them high places and images and groves on every high hill and under every green tree. There you go again. Worship with the tree. I've heard Baptist preachers, I mean, hardcore Baptist evangelists, right? And they will tell me, well, I enjoy my tree. I enjoy my tree. I was like, no, seriously. I mean, in every other area, you would think that they were completely... So I'm not kidding you. Fire breathing, pre everything. I mean, but and then it's like, well, I, I, I bring... I enjoy... I asked them about that. This is before I even studied anything out. I asked them because they, the, they were the hardest preachers I knew. And I was like, oh, brother, what, what do you think about the Christian... Well, I enjoy my tree. Yeah, they're also sodomites. Like, right, occult worship, green trees, swatomites, like uh, my friend says here. Swatomites. There were also swatomites there. In there. I'm sorry, he did it the other day. Smoking. Stop smoking your pot. <laughs> Gets out there and he's preaching. Stop smoking your pot. Your beer. Knock it off. Anyway, sorry. Uh, no, I'm not really. Second Kings chapter 16, verse number four. And we could, by the way, we could do more of a study around all these verses. But these are all occult practices. This is why God destroyed the lands. He destroyed them. He told them, burn it all. Get rid of it all. Why? It's defiled. Second Kings chapter 16, verse number four. And he sacrificed and burnt incense in the high places and on the high hills and under every green tree. There you go. Height of idolatry right there. Trying to take a Christmas tree. By the way, it's even worse because it is an evergreen. If you understand what, and I'm going to get into that, what evergreen trees mean to pagans. I'm, going to, I'm not even going to use my own words. I'm going to use the words of somebody, some other people to show you this, okay? But we're going to start, obviously, with our authority of the Word of God. 2 Kings chapter 17, verse number 10. And they set them up images. This doesn't sound good already, does it? What did God say about grave? I mean, don't. Don't leave the graven images out. And they set them up images and groves in every high hill and under every green tree. It's not looking good for the Christmas side, is it, for the Christmas tree? Not looking good for it at all, is it? All right, Second Chronicles chapter 28, verse number 4. Let's see if we can get any better news here for them. I don't think so. I don't think it's, I don't think it's going to happen. I'm starting to see a pattern here. All right? Second Chronicles chapter 28, verse number 4. He sacrificed also and burnt incense in the high places and on the high hills under every green tree. Well, we just heard that, didn't we? Very similar. That's right. How about Isaiah chapter 57, verse number 5? Let's turn there. Maybe Isaiah will give you some better news for that, for that side. I don't think so, though. 
Those mean old prophets back there. Aren't they mean? They didn't have the Christmas spirit. No, they did not have the Christmas spirit. That's right. By the way, verse number four says, Against whom do you sport yourselves? Against whom make you a wide mouth and draw out the tongue? That's another verse altogether to tackle. Are you not children of transgression, a seed of falsehood? Krampus draws out the tongue. So does Miley Cyrus, but that's, you know. Inflaming, yourself with, uh, inflaming yourselves with idols, look at this, under every green tree. Inflaming yourselves. Slaying the children in the valleys under the cliffs of the rocks. Listen, on a side note, before I forget this, I, I was just reading the history of the Waldensies yesterday. I'm telling you, last night it was making me cry like a baby. I was, I, was reading, I was reading this, and what they did, those popes, what they did. I'm going to read it to you sometime. You need to hear it. You need to understand why men arose and called him the prince of Sodom and the, the reason why they did what they did. You need to understand. You need to know the history. Because it's very sad today that people want to identify with this garbage, this Christmas tree and all this Roman Catholic Babylonian worship garbage, and not separate it and call it out and nail Rome for what it is. Rome has not changed. But look at the inflame. It says inflaming yourselves with idols under every green tree. Anyway, Jeremiah chapter 2, verse number 20. Oh, there's that verse. There's Jeremiah. Jeremiah talked about trees too. He said, For of old time I have broken thy yoke and burst thy bands, and thou saidest, I will not transgress. When upon every high hill and under every green tree thou wanderest playing the harlot. He's telling Israel, he said, man, you're worshiping all these idols. You are playing the harlot. You are committing spiritual idolatry and adultery against me because you have turned your back on me and turned to the way of the heathen and the worship of the heathen. The Lord said also, oh, Jeremiah chapter 3, verse number 6. Go ahead. Yet I have planted thee a noble vine. Yep. That's right. And by the way, I'm going to talk about the difference between vines and trees in a little while in this sermon. So that's, that's going to come up too. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse number 6. The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? Wait a minute. So it's backsliding? Okay, what is backsliding? She has gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. Harlot worship. That's what Christmas trees are. They're harlot worship. Yeah. Say it plain, amen. That's what it is. It's the Bible. It's the Word of God. That's what God said, amen. It's harlot worship. Exactly. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse number 13. Continue on here. How anybody can condone this after studying just a few verses in the Scriptures is beyond me. But I'm going to give you more. I'm going to... I'm going to get you so spiritually piggy fat on it today that you'll have everything you need to understand this and hand this out and give it to everybody. Amen. Oh, it's no big deal. It's just a custom. It's just a tradition. No, it is a big deal to God. What if it's a big deal to God? It is a big deal to God. God cares about how you worship. You're not allowed just to do what you want to do. God cares about how you worship. Right. Not of an obvious, they burned incense they burned strange fire under the Lord and God killed them? Yeah, but that's the Old Testament. That's not the New Testament. What, is it a different God now all of a sudden? Don't frustrate the grace of God. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse number 6. Oh, yeah, verse number 13. Thank you. We just did 6. That's right. Only acknowledge thine iniquity. Oh, let me read number 12 here. Actually, number 11. Let's back up here. And the Lord said unto me, The backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words toward the north. And say, Return thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you. For I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. Only acknowledge thine iniquity. 
that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree. And ye have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. God says they haven't obeyed the voice. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse number 2. Actually, let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 10 and read those verses. Since we're close to that anyway. Might as well read those as we're doing this study, right? Now you start to see. You see the buildup of every green tree? You see that of every, under every green tree, how they worshipped and everything that they did? Now, now do you see this? Okay, now... Now, now come to Jeremiah chapter 10. We've already read a few verses. Jeremiah has already talked about them worshiping under every green tree. they using the trees, deities connected to trees, false god worship, idols, groves, everything like that. Now, read the, con- now the context of Jeremiah chapter 10. Ready? Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. For the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. They are upright as the palm tree. By the way, in Egypt, they didn't have evergreens. They had palm trees. Did somebody say Babylon? There you go. That's right. Tamar, that's right. That's right. That's right. They are, they are brought at the, they, they, that's, that's the Baal worship, that's the, the same worship, same worship. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is in them to do good. Anyway, so what is God saying there? Don't learn the way of the heathen. Learn not the way of the heathen. Stay away from it. All right, then Jeremiah chapter 17, verse number 2. Whilst their children remember their altars and their groves by the green trees upon the high hills. Triple idolatry there, right? Then turn to Ezekiel chapter 6, verse number 13. And I mean, we could read around all those verses, but pretty much what you're going to see is a cultic behavior. You're going to see some sodomite behavior there. You're going to see some things that God hates. That's what you're going to see around all those verses. Every one of them. Every one of these, he's dealing with idolatry and false worship. See, Israel didn't completely forget the Lord their God and everything. They mingled his worship with Baal worship. That's what they did. And that's what Christmas does. It mingles the worship of God with the worship of Baal. That's what it does. Ezekiel chapter 6, verse number 13. Then shall ye know that I am the Lord, when their slain men shall be among their idols round about their altars, upon every high hill in all the tops of the mountains, and under every green tree, and under every thick oak, the place where they did offer sweet savor to all their idols. So when you bring in that Christmas tree into the home, and, the, and then the, they have the, you build the altar around it, right? You fasten it, it's upright. And then you put gifts underneath it. And then people kneel down before it. And then you put the star of your God, Remphan, on the, on the top of it. Or you put Satan claws on the top of it. Or the, fe- or the female angel that God hated. You know, the one with the wings that God hated. The, well, the one that God denounced. What book is that, Nate? Do you remember which book that is? I can't remember it. But Zechariah, where he talks about that that female type, whatever it was, which, it, I mean, it could have came and manifested as that. I, I don't know exactly. But anyway, that's for another. I've never seen any female angels other than that right there is what I saw, and I don't, I've not really studied that out. But anyway, it's interesting. We'll, we can look at that another time. The point is that what is it? It's all idolatry. It has nothing to do with God's worship. Wait, you said that Christmas is all about worshiping the babe born in the manger. It's all about remembering Jesus' birth. It's all about all those things. I don't understand. Wait a minute. So why do you have a bale bush then? Why do you have the bale bush? Why, do you, why is that brought into it? Why is the evergreen? Why, did, why is it pulled out of the forest? Why is it set up in your home? Why is it fastened? Why is it decked with silver and gold? Why is all that added to it? 
I'm going to show you where that came from in modern day America. Though. I'm going to show you all that so you understand. Now, where it came from ancient is right here. You're seeing it. It's always been around. It wasn't new to Christmas. It's always been Babylonian worship. Yeah, I'm going to talk about that too, I think. Ezekiel chapter 6, verse number 13. Then shall you know that I am the Lord when you're... Sl- oh, I read that already. I'm sorry. Um, Ezekiel chapter 17, verse number 24. And all the trees of the field shall know that I, the Lord, have brought down the high tree, have exalted the low tree, have dried up the green tree, and have made the dry tree to flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken and done it. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse number 47. And say to the forests of the south, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will kindle a fire in thee, and it shall devour every green tree in thee, and every dry tree. The flaming flame shall not be quenched, and all faces from the south to the north shall be burned therein. For if they do the... Oh, and anyway, the last verse is Luke chapter 23, verse number 31. I'm just giving you the references to every green tree in the Bible. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? Anyway, so those are the verses. Now, let's look, now we look at the, verse, uh, the, the verses in, in Jeremiah, okay? So the second part of this, I, I read you these verses, all right? Um, I'm going to read them to you again just for sake of, to keep them fresh in your mind as we go through the history of this. Hear ye the word of the Lord, which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen, be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain, for one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold, they fasten it with nails and with hammers, that it move not. Now, Jeremiah chapter 3, verse number 6 again says, The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? So we talked about her backsliding. The high places, remember that now. Remember in Israel, we've, we've, we've preached on that before, the high places. This is where they worshipped at, right? They, the heathens went to the high places to worship. They went where they were to worship their idols and to burn incense and to do all these things in the high places. And they used the green tree to do so, okay? Uh, and the Lord called them on that and said that they were backsliding Israel, okay? Um, and that they're, you know, anyway, so turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you. So God wanted them to repent of that worship with that tree, okay? He, he wanted them to stay away from it. It wasn't biblical worship. It wasn't what he prescribed. If you search the scriptures, if you see what the Bible says about that, you never see that God said, well, worship me with a tree. Well, where did it come from then? Say, well, I'm not doing it because Babylonian worship did it or that, that, that backsliding Israel did it. Yeah, I understand that. You're doing it ignorantly, okay, for the most part. You're doing it ignorantly. So I intend by the grace of God to educate you and show you that God hates it. And either you'll do one or two things. Either you'll get mad at me or you'll get mad at the devil because you were deceived and you'll get right with God. One of those two things will happen. Right, but you will know the truth, all right? Now, what I've shown from the Bible is enough for me to stay away from it. That, to me, is enough to stay completely away from it. And the fact that Christmas is not in the Bible unless you're looking for Babylonian worship and you'll find some of it there. But it's not in the Bible. Now, number three, the green tree or the Christmas tree and the worship of the gods. It's really where I want to take you now. I'm not going to have a lot of Bible verses for this portion because I'm going to give you a history lesson of what took place, okay? You've seen from the Word of God, you've seen what happened, okay? Now we go here. Now, by the way, the first thing you have to remember is Jesus Christ is called the vine and we are the branches. Never the tree, right? Like that, not, not the tree. The tree is not used. Jesus is the vine, all right? Jesus is the vine. The Christmas tree is a phallic symbol, just like the obelisk. Every time you decorate the tree, especially when you hang your round ornaments on it, think about what that symbolizes. I'm not going to get any deeper into that, but I think you understand it. Look, in Masonic order, it was Tubal Cain, okay? So I, I, you'll figure it out. If you, if you don't figure it out, maybe you don't need to know it, but I'm not going to go any further to that, but I, I think it's self-explanatory enough. That's exactly what it was. We know what a phallic symbol is. We understand that. We understand these people are obsessed with fornication. By the way, God always, chat, God always preached against it and said he hated fornication, and, he, and what was it always connected to? The occult practices of the wicked. It was always connected with that, together with it. And God said he hated it. 
And that's exactly what they do with the Christmas. That's the whole point that they use God's creation against him. The whole point was to take that tree and to do that. And isn't it amazing that all these Satanists and witches and pagans and everybody else and the devil has all these Christians having a bale bush in their house, stirring up all that wicked, satanic spirit everywhere? Right. You know, there's more than one meeting that Jesus talked about when he said he was wounded in the house of his friends. I'll leave you to think about that. By the way, Nimrod is pictured with the first Christmas tree and holding a reindeer. So, so you know that Nimrod, he has, a, he has a tree in his hand, and he's holding a reindeer. I don't know, this is too rich. I wish I could show you the, the picture. I don't think I, I... I took a picture of it, but I don't know if I... I think I took it on my... Uh, my, um, my um, what do you call it? Mac, sorry, a, a screenshot of it. But you can... A little, I'll show you this at the break. You can see a picture, and you will see... There's nothing dirty about everything, but it's, it's a picture of Nimrod holding a reindeer in one hand... Big long beard and the bale bush in his other hand. Merry Christmas from Nimrod. <laughs> too rich. Almost too easy. Anyway. All right, so let me read you some things. Many pagan cultures used to cut boughs of evergreen trees in December, move them into the home or temple, and decorate them. Modern day pagans still do. This was this was to recognize the winter solstice. The time of the year that had the shortest daylight hours and the longest night of the year. This occurs annually sometime between December 20th to the 23rd. Most often it is December 21st. By the way, I want you to remember something. These are very, this is a more dangerous time than Halloween. Spiritually speaking, this is more of a, why? Because there's more of a participation in the occult practices at this time of year than any other time right now. It is a dangerous time. Why? Because it's overlooked like it's not a big deal. But when you're learning the way of the heathen and you're following those pagan practices, what are you doing? Well, you're making it real comfortable for devils to be around. Right? Think about it. As the solstice approached, they noticed that the days were gradually getting shorter. Many feared that the sun would eventually disappear forever, and everyone would freeze in the dark and starve to death because of the failure of next year's crops. But even though deciduous trees, bushes, and crops died or hibernated for the winter, the evergreen trees remained green. This is why they worshipped them. Listen. They seemed to have magical powers that enabled them to withstand the rigors of winter. If you go out into my, into my backyard, there's a giant, huge tree, man. It's huge, right? Uh, huge tree, right? It doesn't, it doesn't lose anything during the winter, right? It, it, they're strong trees, right? They stay through. So heathens and pagans, and those they worshipped those trees. Why? Because they had that everlasting regenerative power, they thought. They said they seemed to have magical powers that enabled them to withstand the rigors of winter. Not having evergreen trees, the ancient Egyptians considered the palm tree to symbolize resurrection. They decorated their homes with its branches during the winter solstice. The first decorating of an ever tree began with the heathen Greeks and their worship of their god Adonai, who's ale- who allegedly was brought back to life by the serpent Asulapius after having been slain. What is it? More of the more of the um, Horus, that risen savior, right? That risen god, Invictus Soul, right? Same thing. Same the risen god, right? Not Jesus Christ, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Not him, but the Antichrist. That's who they're talking about. Because we don't need an evergreen to represent Jesus Christ. Or a crucifix. That's right. Or a cracker. Or a pope. The prince of Sodom. The ancient pagan Romans decorated their trees with bits of metal and replicas of their god, Bacchus, a fertility god. They also placed, listen, 12 candles on the tree in honor of their sun god. 12 days of Christmas? A partridge in a pear tree? And Bacchus? Their midwinter festival of Saturnalia, 
started on December 17th and often lasted until a few days after the solstice. In northern Europe, the ancient Germanic people, man, those Germans, I'm telling you what, they were some wicked people. I'm sorry if you're German. I'm telling you, yeah, that's where everything comes, the higher criticism, everything, German rationalism, bunch of wicked devils over there, man. I'm not kidding you, man. They did it. When you start to study that area out for occult practice, it is the one wicked place and has been for a very long time. I would sure like to know why. Yes. What's that? Yeah. Yeah. In Northern Europe, the ancient Germanic people tied fruit and attached candles to evergreen tree branches in honor of their god, Woden. Is it Odin without the W? Is it Woden? Woden or Odin? Trees were viewed as symbolizing eternal life. That's why they use it. It, it symbolized eternal life for them. This is the deity after which Woden's day or Wednesday was named. The trees joined holly, mistletoe, and was, wassail. I always get that wrong. Wassail, wassail, whatever it is. Bulls and yule logs. As symbols of the season, all of these predated Christianity. By the way, all these are practices of Christians today. Listen, don't get mad. Get informed and get right. When your family and your friends hear this sermon because they're gonna, they love to listen to get mad at me, please listen all the way through and just get right with God about it. You'll even save money. You'll save big money. That's right. That's right. Not by switching to Geico, but switching from paganism to Christianity. By not learning the way of the heathen. God will prosper you. That's right. All right. So anyway, so Druid priest. How about the, all those Druids? Some of those right here in town, right? The Druid priests in Great Britain also used evergreen plants and mistletoe in pagan ceremonies. And the mistletoe plant was the symbol of the birth of a god. Is that what you do when you hang up the mistletoe in your house and you kiss under it? Is that, by the way, you have no idea what you're mimicking there. You are mimicking extreme amounts of fornication and the same party that was when Moses came off the mount that they were having there. I'm trying not to use some words that I don't like, but um, the same party they were having as they came down from the mount, that big fornicating party they were having, well, that's what the heathens do. That's what the pagans do. I won't even tell you what they used to, well, I will tell you what they used to do to the Jews that were slaves in, these, in, in, Roma, in Roman Catholicism at this, at this Saturnalia, at these, these events. They would strip them naked down through and they would make them run through there to, to run for their lives. And they would fill them so, so full of food that they couldn't run fast. And then yeah, and then they laughed, so they slaughtered them and killed them. Mm -hmm. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. <clears throat> Druid priests in Great Britain, they used evergreen plants and mistletoes in pagan ceremonies. And the mistletoe plant was the symbol of the birth of a god. Is that why you do it? No, that's not why I do it. It doesn't matter. You're still following the way of the heathen. Right. Celtic Druids and Norsemen of Scandinavia also used mistletoe in a mysterious ceremony just after the winter solstice. In the mid-1500s, Germans began using evergreen trees as a symbol of hope for the coming of spring. This practice is likely to have gradually evolved from pagan rituals of the past. Well, no kidding. And merged with the celebration of Christmas leading to the tree's Christian beginnings. There are also claims that the first proper Christmas tree was erected in Riga, Lat Lat Latvia in 1510. Today there is a plaque in the town square, Hall Square in Riga that is engraved with the text, the first New Year's tree in Riga in, 10, in 1510. It is believed that this tree was burned during a New Year's celebration and possibly decorated with paper flowers. However, it seems more likely that this celebration was related more to the Christmas tree's pagan past. The pagan past. The most likely Christian beginnings of the modern Christmas tree were in the mid-1500s in Germany. In 1521, the region of Alsace, formerly, <coughs> excuse me, uh, formerly part of Germany, <coughs> excuse me, formerly part of Germany, 
The first pine tree was decorated and used in a Christmas celebration. In 1539, in the Cathedral of Strasbourg, there are, there are church records that state a Christmas tree was used for Christmas celebration. And in 1570, there are reports from a Bremen Guild chronicle that a fir tree was decorated with fruits and nuts, which children ate on Christmas Day. In the 1700s, the Christmas tree custom had spread throughout nor northern Germany, and people began decorating the tree with candles that were lit on Christmas Eve, as is still done today in many homes across Europe. As the Christmas tree custom spread through Germany, the Roman Catholic Church eventually recognized it in the early 1800s. It was introduced to Vienna in 1816, quickly spreading across Austria, and in 1840 to France by the Duchess of Orleans. The Orleans. The nor okay, now... I want to give you the Norse pagan history of, of, of the tree, okay? So you understand. that. Have you, have you noticed how none of this is scriptural? You don't find any of the doing this in scripture. You don't find any of those things there. What do, you, what do you find here? To fully appreciate the history of the Christmas tree, one must understand. Now listen, this is from, um, excuse me, DeLongFarms.com. They sell Christmas trees, I believe. So they're giving you the real history. Now this isn't an independent Baptist, okay? This is somebody that makes money off selling trees so they want to give you the true history of it they're pretty excited to share that with you and i'm also excited to share this with you i'm very excited to share this with you okay i am listen closely please to fully appreciate the history of the christmas tree one must understand the mystical importance coniferous evergreens held for the pagan norsemen who inhabited the frigid and often enchanting forests of northern germany now, we don't want to get into why these forests were enchanting and what things were going on there, okay? I'm not going to get into that because you're going to think I'm spookier than I already am, so I'm just going to keep moving here, all right? We'll save that for something else. Right? This era of pre-Christian Germanic history can be characterized as a time as savage as it was beautiful, mystical as it was mysterious, and as warm-hearted as it was cold and bitter in a frozen landscape. Pre-Christian pagans pre-christian pagans inhabited a land that they believed they shared with numerous gods nature spirits and demons a common example was the norse worship of the oak tree its strong and long burning wood was a sign of the strength of the spirits that inhabited the oak and it was often used as a symbol of the norse god chieftain odin when the seasons turned, however, and winter brought with it numerous evils and malicious spirits stalking the shadows of wintry forest, the pagan peoples would turn to the aid and magic of any nature spirits that would help them. Plants and trees, such as mistletoe, holly, and evergreen, unlike the aforementioned oak tree, were believed to have some special power against the darker magics of winter because they were the only plants that stayed green throughout the year. During the winter, to shore their home from male violent winter spirits pagan germanic peoples would hang wreaths and bushels of evergreens over their doors and windows believing their spirit was enough to ward off winter evils now let me stop there and tell you this hanging wreaths on your home is a pagan custom yeah. hanging it on your doorway is a pagan custom right. in front of your do people put them in front of their car what for i don't get it helps their heater Protect their car from elves? Well, that's what this was for. This was to protect them against the winter and the evil spirits. So they hung a wreath on the outside of their house, on their front door. Listen, you have to understand something, that signs and symbols, they mean something, okay? Right. When people do things, they mean something. You talk to any Freemason, they'll look at it. Man, they know exactly what that means. You talk to people like that in the occult, they know exactly what that means. They know if they see that. So listen, don't, no matter how pretty you think wreaths and all that stuff are, those, those are pagan customs. They're not biblical. They're done for a purpose and a reason. Okay. In many cases, evergreen decor were brought indoors where their scent could freshen the dark medieval homes of otherwise stagnant straw and, and thresh. The needles and cones could even be burned as a form of incense. It's smoke and fragrance filling the home with the protective spirit magic of the evergreen. What's that? I thought you said pot. Did you say? Oh, okay. I was like, that's not very good. You shouldn't like that smell at all. I thought you like the smell of pine. Okay, well, good. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. God gave it. You know, I mean, there's nothing wrong with liking the smell of what God made. Well, except pot. You shouldn't like that because that's, <laughs> that's getting off into Never mind. I got to keep going here. All right. D during the winter solstice, when winter was at its darkest and the days were shortest the year of the year of the Germanic lunar calendar, 
Celtic and pagan civilizations throughout northern Europe would celebrate and sacrifice to the Norse, Norse god Jul. Pronounced, oh, Yule, sorry. Pronounced and contemporarily recognized as Yule. And celebrate their Yule Tide Festival. Yep. This is the tradition from which we have our Yule log today. Well, I don't have it, but you might have it. The Germanic practice, however, involved cutting down a massive hardwood log that was large enough to burn for 12 days in feasting, of feasting and sacrifice the 12 days of Christmas. Well, there you go. Man, you just have to ruin everybody's fun, don't you? Nothing like bringing a little bit of truth of the paganism of it to just ruin your fun as a Christian. Well, some people out there that listen to this, it won't ruin their fun because they're going to continue to do it either way. Then they sin with knowledge, which we're going to talk about this afternoon. Him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. That's another sermon, though. We'll save that for later. Amen. That's right. Cross those deadlines. That's right. However, it involved cutting down a massive hardwood. Okay, we got that. That was large enough to burn for 12 days of feasting and sacrifice. Wait a minute. So the 12, practicing the 12 days of Christmas is a sacrifice? To what? To Baal. False gods. Whatever you want to call them. Satan, eventually. He doesn't care what you call him. He's a liar. He doesn't care what you call him. As long as you're not worshiping the God of the Bible, you can call him whatever you want to. He does not care. That's right. He likes that better. All right, and served as a fertility symbol to both help with the coming of spring and prophesy its bounty. So it was a fertility sacrifice. During the winter solstice, these, when winter had its strongest influence on the frozen landscape, Norse pagans would, by tradition, bring entire evergreen trees into their home. Oh, the entire, oh, okay. These massive evergreens were called Yule trees, and it was believed that the spirits of the trees would inhabit their home and bless its inhabitants. This practice was of as much winter solstice tradition as it was mystical protection from the night-faring spirits during the darkest times of the year. Okay. You learning anything? During the 8th century, missionaries... Oh, look, listen, this is, this, you're going to love this even more. You ready for this? When you hear that word missionary way back then, you know it's talking about somebody else. It's talking about Rome, okay? But anyway, you ready? During the 8th century, missionaries from the Holy Roman Catholic Church began, oh, I'm just quoting this, yeah, began to make their way north to what is now Germany and the Netherlands. On such missionary, one such missionary, who would become the saintly bishop of Germany, was Boniface, Boniface. Now, old, good old Boniface is back. Boniface of tradition. Boniface, a stalwart and moral Gentile, was quickly set, set aback by the pagan rituals of polytheism, nature worship, and human sacrifice. <laughs> he was set back by that. <laughs> While many Germanic people readily accepted the Catholic faith, there were still some hardened tribes that even proved violently hostile in their resistance to Catholic missionaries, such as Boniface. It would be in the single legendary act that St. Boniface of tradition seemed to symbolically set the tone for the Holy Roman Catholic Church. He set the tone. Listen to what he did. Instead of usurping the pagan faith completely with Catholicism, they don't ever do that, do they? No, we're not going to do that. Boniface chose to shift their focus and also adopted the more desirable pagan beliefs and customs himself. It is said that when St. Boniface came, to, came across a human sacrifice at the foot of the Oak of Thor in Geismar, Boniface cut down the oak in a symbolic act of removing the older barbaric Celtic traditions, pointing to an evergreen that was growing at the roots of the fallen oak. St. Boniface said, This humble tree's wood is used to build your homes. Let Christ be at the center of your households. It leave, its leaves remain evergreen in the darkest days. Let Christ be your constant light. Its bows reach out to embrace and its top points to heaven. Let Christ be your comfort and guide. In much the same way that the Holy Roman Catholic Church assimilated many other pagan customs and traditions to help with the converting of the northern Germanic peoples, St. Boniface accommodated the pre-existing Celtic belief in the mysticism of evergreens and incorporated it to help with a smoother transition for pagan peoples over to the Catholicism. 
What a missionary, huh? In many ways, this legend of St. Boniface of Credition would have helped with the incorporation of the Yule trees and Yuletide evergreens of the Germanic winter solstice into the Romans Christ Mass celebrating. Oh, did you hear that? What did I tell you before? Rome borrowed all of it from paganism, and they can have it. What would happen if all of the, uh, all of the born-again believers and Christians across the world just said, nope, we're done with it. We're not going to have anything to do with this. Markets would crash. There wouldn't be a Black Friday. Why they got to call it Black Friday? I'm just kidding. Anyway, were they... <laughs> anyway what, what would happen if all of them... Yeah, exactly. It's true. There you go. So listen to this again. I want to read just this part to you again here. The Yuletide evergreens of the Germanic winter solstice, they, they helped incorporate the Yule trees into the Roman Christ Mass, celebrating the birth of their Savior, Jesus. The converted Germans who were celebrating Christ Mass would have celebrated in much the same way as they did with winter solstice. And Christians today that will hang these trees in their home and they'll put these trees in their home and deck them and everything else and practice Christians, what are they doing? They are identifying with winter solstice. They are identifying with paganism and witchcraft. They are identifying with Rome. For many of their central traditions being more Gentile, the evergreen trees that they brought indoors were now symbols of the Holy Trinity. The stars at the top serving as a symbol of heaven and God. Apples were hung from the branches that would later become Christmas decorations, symbolizing the fruit of the tree of knowledge in the Garden of Eden. Wow. Wow. This keeps getting worse. Um, I don't know, but we don't want to symbolize that tree. <laughs> tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's not a good... I mean, that's not... Yeah, that's probably not so good. The tradition would continue until the Victorian era, where not one single, where not a single German household was complete at Christmas without a small tabletop Tannenbaum. Did I say that word? Tannenbaum, Tannenbaum, or Yule tree, or like I like to call it, bale bush. While the Yule trees, okay, now the history of the Victorian Christmas tree. When the, while the Yule trees of Germany may have made appearances throughout Europe after being culturally transplanted from Germany, the Victorian Christmas tree hadn't made its popular Victorian appearance until 1848. With the marriage of Princess Victoria to her cousin, Prince Albert, that's weird, of Germany, the custom of the Christmas tree came with a new Prince of England and was celebrated at Windsor Palace for the sake of the young royal family. Prince Albert in a can? No. Prince Albert had written, I must now seek in the children an echo of what Ernest Albert's brother and I were in the old time, of what we felt and thought and their delight in the Christmas trees is not less than ours used to be. At this, the London Illustrated News published a wood carving print of the young royal family at Christmas time with a decadently decorated Christmas tree in the December of 1848. With the widespread distribution of the illustration, within two years, every home in England had an evergreen Christmas tree in their home. When in Rome. An interesting attribute of the Victorian era, and incidentally the Victorian Christmas, was the popular attempt to bring elements of the countryside into city homes during the holiday season. Thanks to the Victorian era, Industrial Revolution, a significant concentration of the nation's newly wealthy we're living in cities. With this move away from country homes and villas, successful and independently wealthy alike quickly picked up where Prince Albert left off. In an attempt to recapture a quaint and warm image of the countryside and the country homes that had left behind, Victorians had Christmas trees that were elegantly decorated with glass ornaments, silver tinsel, gold stars, and delicate candles that would glow over the children's Christmas gifts. Evergreen Christmas wreaths that were decorated with an array of dried berries, apples, and ribbons were popular with the Victorians and would be hung on doors and given as gifts to loved ones for the holidays. In much the same we associate the Victorian era with decadent crafts and decorations, it was the Victorian era that truly made Christmas trees and Christmas wreaths what they are today. So they just 
put a bunch of tradition into it, and that's why people have so much tradition in there. When they see a Christmas tree, they want to bawl like a baby and be like, oh, it's so great. I mean, seriously, even like since I was a kid, I always thought it was all lame. I was like, this is all just lame. I was in it for the money. I was in it for the PlayStation, the Nintendo, the, the Super Nintendo. The Atari 2600. Whoa, going way back. Some of you can't handle that. You remember it? No, you're not old enough. How old are you? You're 26? I remember 26. You played what? Burn. Remember that noise? Burn. When you, anyway, sorry. But uh, Pitfall was just, yeah, it was just, it was, I did, I, I, I did, you, did you, you never played that? No, you were on a farm, right? Slapping hogs. You were just like slapping hogs, like riding hogs in the back or something. That's what you were doing. Never mind, I forgot. You were, you were one of those, those kind of guys. One of those kids. Yeah, he wasn't a dirt bag like me. He was one of those kids that, anyway. That's what it was about for me, though. I didn't, I didn't really care about. I mean, that's in the tree. You, whatever, you can do whatever you want. But I mean, anyway, had, why hasn't it ever dawned on anybody that like putting an angel with wings on top of a tree might not be a good thing? Like Christians, born again believers that read the Bible at all, just a little bit. Why have we never thought about that? You know, that might not be a good idea. Like hanging an angel, <laughs> an angel on a tree. Or lighting candles on it, like that's that's not very safe. I don't know. I mean, it's, we we moved away from that. The EPA frowned on that or whatever, so we just we we moved we moved away from that and made lights instead, right? But uh, for the less wealthy and poor, Victorian era was the pinnacle of the industrial revolution. So anyway, they the factories. And all, I'm not going to read to that stuff. It really doesn't matter. But it was symbolic, and they did all this other stuff. And oh, by the way, this is important. Most importantly, evergreens were used as a symbol of the holiday season and at a time for the philanthropy and goodwill that the Victorian era bestowed on the celebration. Thanks to writers and poets such as Clement Clark Moore, A Visit from Saint Nicholas, or The Night Before Christmas, published in 1823. And Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol, published in 1843. See, all these were clever marketing techniques, and they worked brilliantly to paganize people. Because everybody attaches their emotions and their feelings to all those things when they heard those songs as they were growing up. I mean, honestly, like if you think of something like, Oh, Christmas Tree, Oh, Christmas Tree. Just think about it. You're like singing to a tree. And just look at the tree. Look. There's lights on a tree. This is confession time. Paul says it was a slobbering drunk fest in his family. It was. It was. It's the way it was. Anyway, so um, evergreen Christmas decor represented a shift in the emotional climate. That's true because, you know, around that time what happened around the world and is happening today is we switched over to an emotional-based society that, did, that no longer cared about what the truth was but cared more about how you feel. And that's pushed by Hollywood, by writers, by, by magazines, by songs, by everything. That's, and that's what happens. Evergreen Christmas decor represented a shift in the emotional climate away from the workhouses and begging orphans towards a warmer spirit of heartfelt benevolence and charity. Can you feel it? I last night when I, yesterday when we were out preaching, I I felt that Christmas love when he cussed out and flicked off, and as they walk away with their Christmas wrapping paper, flicking me off. You're preaching hate. I hate you. <laughs> and then I walked down the street and Black Lives Matter was having a protest. I was like, come on, Paul, we got to go. I just had to look at it. I got it on video. Black Lives Matter. They were having, and, I, and I said, Paul, me and Aaron thought that we'd make a new group called Fat Lives Matter. And... <laughs> Come on, you're ruining my joke. Knock it off. It's a joke. <laughs> anyway, it was funny, I thought. But 
So me and Paul went in, and we were going to see if we could preach there, and we thought, no, we'll probably get mauled by all these people. Yeah, <laughs> it would be a good idea. <laughs> but I did find it rather interesting that at a Black Lives Matter rally, there was literally more white people than black people. <laughs> yep. I don't know what that was about, but it was really weird. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, the pink Black Lives Matter, yeah. Okay, anyway, moving on here. The history of the Christmas tree here. I've got to keep moving here. We're, we're almost done in, in like two hours here, I think. The English, <laughs> the English Puritans condemned a number of customs associated with Christmas, such as the use of the Yule log, holly, mistletoe, etc. Now, understand this. I want to say something to you. I, the Puritans were wrong in their form of government, okay? So we don't condone them persecuting people that believe differently than them, okay? We believe in liberty of conscience. The purpose of this is to show you that most Christians, and Baptists would have been included in all these, they hated this stuff. They were against it. They were against the practice of Christmas. They knew it was pagan. They were against trees and everything else. But I want to read you. Uh, by, by the way, I was reading the history of the Waldenses yes, last night, and I was reading Oliver Cromwell, all right? Oliver Cromwell was a protector. He was called the Lord Protector of England. And he went over there, and he basically told them, you know, if you don't stop, I'm going to do something about it because they were killing the Waldenses. And if you read, I'm reading his letters right now that he wrote and the, the, what they did to those people and why he protected them, you know, and he was, he was getting very angry. I mean, he was getting, he was tired of it, you know what I mean? But anyway, so he was a good man. I mean, he wasn't perfect, but he was a good man in a lot of ways. All right, and he fought the Jesuits. Big time. In fact, the Jesuits, there was, when, when Oliver Cromwell sent an ambassador over there to the Duke of Savoy to tell him, hey, listen, you better stop killing these people. You better leave, you better, you need to restore them their liberty of conscience. They were afraid of Oliver Cromwell, which they should have been. You know what I mean? Um, and he said, you got to stop doing that. Well, he said that he was visited by numerous Jesuits who told him that, no, but this is not going on. Nobody's being killed over here. This isn't happening. They're not killing these people. They're lying to you. Don't believe that. And that ambassador, he just kind of laughed it off. He was like, yeah, right. He said, I was visited by a few Jesuits that kept telling me over and over again that nothing was going on, that nobody was being murdered over there. And he didn't buy it. You know what I mean? He didn't buy it at all. But anyway, it was just an interesting point of history there in, in looking at that. But you, you see, that's where the persecution came from. Anyway, but Oliver Cromwell, he preached against this. He said this. He preached against the heathen traditions of Christmas carols. Really? Decorated trees. And any joyful expression that desecrated that sacred event. He called it a desecration of the birth of Christ. Why? Because they were all pagan traditions. He said it's a desecration of Christ. Tertullian, 160 to 230. He said this, an early Christian leader and a prolific writer, they're explaining this, and complain, he complained that too many fellow Christians had copied the pagan practice of adorning their houses with lamps and with wreaths of laurel at Christmas time. Ludwig Furenbringer adds some more details to the historic event of the Christmas tree here. Now, this is where it came in America. The first church it came to in America was a Lutheran church. The Germans brought it over. Yep, the Germans brought it over. Ludwig, he adds some more detail to the historic event. Schwann was the first one to introduce the Christmas tree in church, and, his, and, and this took place in the, 50, in the 1850s in Cleveland. It caused a real sensation in the city, and to some extent it became the talk of the town. In those days, a very pronounced, reformed, unliturgical, I hate that word, ideas. It was considered almost a sacrilege to everybody around. Understand, mainstream churches did not celebrate this. They said it's wig, it's paganism. Listen. That a special, you know, it should be observed, it should not be observed in the church. And above all things, that the sanctuary, they, they, they call it the sanctuary, obviously. We don't have a sanctuary here, amen, but, but that's what they called it. The sanctuary should be desecrated by the introduction of a Christmas tree, decorated undoubtedly in the, in the unusual way, in the usual way. Schwann even had constructed the story of Bethlehem in little figures under the Christmas tree, and that especially was regarded as an abomination. 
So in 1850, it was regarded even in a Lutheran church. It was a Missouri Synod church, and they were strict. It was regarded as an abomination to have a nativity scene. Not to mention a tree. Even in factories, members of Schwann's church were accosted, and to some, the, int the intimation was given that they could hardly continue in their factory employment if they were in harmony with such ex execrable practices. I don't know what that means. It means what? Oh, you said ex excrement? No that, no, that wasn't what it said. It's the root word, yeah. Stop that. Okay, something detestable, like Dookie. Early on Christmas Eve in 1851, the Reverend, the Reverend Schwann, newly, Reverend Schwann, newly installed pastor at Zion Lutheran Church in Cleveland, went into the forest near his parsonage and, near his parsonage, and, no, he didn't read the Bible, and chopped down a small, beautifully shaped evergreen. After taking it into his church and placing it in the prominent spot in the chancel. What's a chancel? Anybody know what a chancel is? Okay. In the, in, in, in the chancel. He, yeah, in the Babel building. And his wife, Emma, spent the afternoon trimming the tree. You got, even got Emma involved with this mess, okay? It, it, <laughs> spent the afternoon trimming the tree with cookies, colored rip. How do you? Oh, he ate cookies. He didn't trim the tree with cookies. I was like, that's kind of weird. <laughs> I was like, how do you do that? Trim the tree with cookies, uh, colored ribbons, fancy nuts, and candles. A silver star that Schwann had brought with him from his boyhood home in Hanover, Germany. Topping off the tree was a reminder of his happy boyhood Christmas. Christmases, that's what it says. He wanted to share this same happiness with the members of his congregation, most of whom were also German-born and thus likely to have seen a Christmas tree in their past. The custom hadn't caught on yet in America. Most of the members of his congregation were pleasantly surprised. The wonderful Christmas memories of the old country were enkindled by the slight, by the sight of the beautifully decorated lighted tree. Others, however, were offended by the idea of having a Tannenbaum in a church. Within a day or two, Schwann's Christmas tree was the talk of the town, and the talk was not good. A prominent local newspaper called it nonsensical, asinine, moronic, absurdity. Besides being silly... It editorialized against these Lutherans worshiping a tree, groveling before a shrub. Wow. Yep. That was the Lutherans. Worse, it recommended that the good Christian citizens of Cleveland ostracize, shun, and refuse to do business with anyone who tolerates such heathenish, idolatrous practices in his church. Even members of the congregation thought it was sacrilege and idolatry to have such a tree in the church. During the following year, Schwann carefully researched the issue of Christmas trees. He ultimately, concluded, he ultimately concluded that such trees were not a sacrilege, but rather a solid Christian custom. I don't know where he concluded that from. A custom in which Christmas could express, Christians could express their joy at the birth of the Christ child. The claim has been made that Pastor Schwann was the first to introduce the use of the Christmas tree at a church. That claim, however, is not quite correct. There is evidence that Reverend John Muehlhauser of Rochester, New York, used the Christmas tree at his church as early as 1840. There, however, it was chiefly a money-making scheme, admission being charged to raise money for the church. At least he got some money out of it. Therefore, although Pastor Schwann was not the first to introduce the Christmas tree into the church, as was believed for a time, he may still be credited with, with him the honor of lifting the custom to a worthy plane and bringing it out of its, its beautiful significance. End quote. Although Pastor Schwann was not the first to decorate the Christmas tree in North America, he was the first to introduce one into a church. And he was almost single-handedly responsible for this custom, gaining widespread acceptance and popularity into America. How would you like to be known as that guy that did that? I want to be known as that guy that brought the bale bush into the church in America. Be known as that. The location of Zion Lutheran Church has changed since the 1850s, but on its original spot, the corner of Lakeside Avenue on East 6th Street, stands a historical marker that states this. On this site stood the first Christmas tree in America, publicly lighted and displayed in a church Christmas ceremony. Here stood the original Zion Lutheran Church, where in 1851, on Christmas Eve, Pastor Henry Schwann 
lighted the first Christmas tree in Cleveland. The tradition he brought from Germany soon became widely accepted throughout America, the present site of Zion Lutheran Church. Anyway, so obviously the Christmas tree also, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert, we talked about that in the 1840s and 1850s. They popularized it. They made it popular in England and all over the world because everybody wanted to do what royalty did, right? The newspaper reported, descri- report described an interesting festival of the Christmas tree, which was viewed at Concord, Massachusetts. Concord! It's Concord! It's not Concord, right, Paul? Concord! Thank you. All right, I got it right. In Concord, Massachusetts, on Christmas Eve, 1853, according to the account in the Springfield Republican, all the children of the town participated in someone dressed as St. Nicholas distributed presents. How does St. Nicholas dress? Like Krampus? Like a pope, that's right. Two years later, in 1855, the Times Pecan in New Orleans published an article noting that St. Paul's Episcopal Church would be setting up a Christmas tree. This is a German custom, the newspaper explained, and one that has been of late years imported into this country to the great delight of the young folks who are its special beneficiaries. Right? All right, we're almost done here. A tree of evergreen in size. He explained it. Here's an article. I want, you to, I want you to understand this. Here's an article in a New South Orleans newspaper describing this tree and what happened. Okay? A tree of evergreen in size adapted to the dimension of the room in which it is displayed is selected, the trunk and branches of which are to be hung with brilliant lights and laden from the lowest bough to the topest, topmost branch with Christmas gifts, delicacies, ornaments, etc., and of every imaginable variety, forming a perfect storehouse of rare presents from old Santa Claus. What indeed can be more gratifying to children than to take them where their eyes will glow big and bright, feasting on such a sight on the eve of Christmas? A Philadelphia newspaper... Now, understand, they didn't have television, right? So you're describing this in in an article, and that's amazing to people. What is that doing? Making them want one. Right? A Philadelphia newspaper, the press, published an article on Christmas Day in 1857 which detailed how various ethnic groups had brought their own Christmas customs to America. It is said from Germany in particular comes the Christmas tree, hung all around with gifts of all sorts, interspersed with crowds of small tapers which illuminate the trees and excite general admiration. The 1857 article from Philadelphia whimsically describes Christmas trees as immigrants who had become citizens, stating we are naturalizing the Christmas tree. And by, the time, by that time, the employee of, an employee of Thomas Edison created the first electric Christmas tree in the 1880s. The Christmas tree custom, whatever its origins, was permanently established. Now, listen to this. Man, I thought I was almost done. Whew. Baptists of the South and the faith community of Southern Baptists after 1845, originally did not attach much significance to Christmas. The holiday is not recognized as a special day of worship in any of the historic Baptist confessions. Allusions to it are rare in Baptist history, volumes before 1880, and the holiday possessed an association with worldliness. Listen, that's how the Baptists viewed it, with worldliness and paganism and even paganism in the minds of many Baptist ministers. Such opinions can still be found among some Baptists today, amen, who voice, quote, the New Testament does not command us to celebrate a festival commemorating the nativity, end quote. There was always opposition to Christmas trees in America. It went by such name, Christmas the day went by such names as the profane man's ranting day. That's what they called it. The superstitious man's idol day. The papist massing day. The old heathen's feasting day. (laughs) The multitude's idol day. And Satan, that adversary's working day. That's our crowd, crowd. amen. Okay, I want, to read you, I want to read you something here that I, I believe will kind of drive this home, and we'll, we'll be finishing up here in just a few minutes here. 
It's from an article called, and this is at a paganwiccan.about.com. The question is asked, I'm pagan. Can I still have a holiday tree? I'm pagan. Can I still have a holiday tree? I really want to celebrate Yule as a pagan, but my kids have gotten to expect a Christmas tree each year. Can I have one? The short answer to that question is, it's your house. You could decorate it in any way you like. The slightly longer answer is that a lot of modern pagans find a way to blend the Christmas traditions of their childhood with the pagan beliefs they come to embrace as adults. So yes, I would agree. there's a lot of Baptist people that can symbolize with the pagans as adults too as well, that they can adapt the pagan rituals and make them Christian. So you see the similarities here in the two? Now listen, you're going to see the same arguments that born-again Christians make today to defend Christmas. This pagan is going to make the same arguments for paganism. Yep. Henry Schwann who bought the Christmas tree. Yeah. Went to the same university as Hegel. He went to the same university as Hegel? Wow. Isn't that Hegel was the man that brought in, he, he falsified all the pictures of, in evolution. He was one of Darwin's soldiers. You know, that's interesting, isn't it? Okay, he said, so, so yes, you can have a family Yule celebration and still have a holiday tree and have stockings with care by the fire. During the Roman festival of, of Saturnalia, celebrants often decorated their homes with clippings of shrubs and hung metal ornaments outside on trees. Typically, the ornaments represent, represented a god, either Saturn or the family's patron deity. Listen. The laurel wreath was a popular decoration as well. The ancient Egyptians didn't have evergreen trees, but they had palms. And the palm tree was a symbol of resurrection, rebirth. They often brought the fronds into their homes during the time of the winter solstice. Early Germanic tribes decorated trees with fruit and candles in honor of Odin for the solstice. These are the folks who brought us the words Yule, Wassel, as well as the tradition of Yule Log. In other words, if you want to have a decorated tree for the holiday, don't let anyone tell you it doesn't have pagan origins. <laughs> Obviously, you probably won't want to hang a little baby Jesus or a bunch of crosses on it like your Christian neighbors, but there are a ton of other things out there you can use. <laughs> suns, and, suns and solar ornaments raid the craft stores and find stars to turn into suns. God's eyes make them out of cinnamon sticks and seasonal colored yarn or ribbons. Pipe cleaner pentacles make them out of shiny chenille stems bent into stars with circles around them. Nature objects like acorns, feathers, holly, mistletoe, or pine cones. Lights, lights, and more lights. Colors of the season, red, green, gold, and white. Magical items. Cups, wands, or daggers. Fertility symbols. Eggs, antlers, horns. Even phalluses, if you don't mind shocking grandma a bit. <laughs> so what about a tree topper? Usually they're found, they're found pre-made as angels. But you could substitute a star, a Santa Claus... It is rich, isn't it? Or some other item that strikes you as appropriate. One of the best tree toppers I ever saw was actually a tin green man wall hanging. What's a tin green man? That's weird. The bottom line is, if you want to have a holiday tree for Yule, then you go right ahead and have one. Decorate it in the way that speaks to you. And enjoy your holiday. After all, the winter solstice only comes once a year. Well, no, they're pagans. They just say, just take the Jesus out of it, and you can do everything the same. Right. Are you starting to understand? All they did, that was from a pagan website. All they did was add Jesus to it. And then, of course, you have, you have the song, O Christmas Tree, O Christmas Tree, Thy Leaves Are So Unchanging. Did anybody ever sing that song? You sang it, Lee. Lee? <laughs> Nate did. Brother Paul sang it. You sang it? Can I ask you a question? Was that ever sung at church? 
Do you ever be, remember that being at church? Did you ever lead that at church? Do you have any knowledge or anywhere? No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> do you, do you, that's right. You have the right to remain silent. That's right. Hey, I sang it. I mean, I didn't really care. I just, you know, whatever. But I, I probably sang it, I'm sure. I don't know. I didn't really sing that much, so I don't know if I did. But Oh, Christmas tree, oh, Christmas tree, thy leaves are so unchanging. Oh, Christmas tree, oh, Christmas tree, thy leaves are so unchanging. Not only green when summer's here, but also when it's cold and drear. Oh, Christmas tree, oh, Christmas tree, thy leaves are so unchanging. Now, why are you singing to a tree? Why do so many Christians sing this song and not even think about the words? But yet, we would be the first people to condemn those that sing rock and roll music. And we would tell them that they're wicked, and that's wicked pagan music, that's wicked, and then sing this song in church or, you know... Christmas caroling, which is pagan, by the way. Because, well, most of the time Christmas caroling was they, they would run th- they would walk through the streets naked singing is what that would be, and drunk. What's that? No, they were naked and drunk, and that's what they, I mean, Christians just keep their clothes on and maybe don't drink, and they do it. But it's, the custom is from there. That's where it's from. Oh, Christmas tree, oh, Christmas tree, such pleasure do you bring me. Now, how does a tree bring you any pleasure? I mean, honestly, like, they bring it in. You bring me so much pleasure. How? Like, it's just stupid. It doesn't, what, how does it bring you any pleasure? This is vanity is what it is. It's singing, you're singing, so you don't even know what you're saying. It's idolatry, yeah, but you're, you're vainly doing so you don't even know what you're doing. You don't even analyze. But when somebody comes along and just analyzes it, it makes you mad, you know? It makes you like, man, that ticks me off. Well, it ticks me off that I sang something so stupid. For every year this Christmas tree brings us such joy and glee. Oh, Christmas tree, oh, Christmas tree, such pleasure do you bring me. You'll ever be unchanging. A symbol of goodwill and love, you'll ever be unchanging. Well, the love the pagans were talking about was not the love that maybe you're thinking of. Each shining light, each silver bell, no one alive spreads cheer so well. Not even Jesus? So the Christmas tree brings more joy than Jesus? It's over. I destroyed the tree. It's done. I've been guilty of kicking Mickey, punching Donald, and burning your Christmas tree. Oh, Christmas tree, oh, Christmas tree. You'll ever be unchanging. You will. You will always be a symbol of paganism. You will always not, you are never to mix that worship with the worship of Christ or of God. It has nothing to do with the worship of Christ. It has nothing to do, it is the worship of Baal. It is the worship, it's exactly what it is. It's a Baal bush. And let it be accursed. Let the custom be accursed. It's Antichrist. It's a picture of the, of the Antichrist. That's what it's about. Right. Let it be accursed. We should have nothing to do with such a thing. It brings the world together. That's right. Look at that. They light a Christmas tree where in Times Square. Don't they light that Christmas tree? And then they, they, don't they light that in Times Square and all these people come out and everybody else comes out? I, it's funny because I'm going out there and I'm looking at things like Black Lives Matter and how many people are in the streets you know, and everything else. And then I look at like when they light a stupid tree and they turn and everybody's like, Rockefeller Center, that's right. There you go. <laughs> Need I say more? And by the way, and they'll, at the Vatican, what do they do? Retreat. Same thing, they light it. El Papa there, of uh, the Prince of Sodom, right? What does he do? He lights his tree. And all the Christians are, and he says mass, right? <laughs> that's what he does, right? It is. That's what they do. So let me ask you this. Why does everybody love him? Why does everybody love that tree? Why does everybody love those customs? But when you stand up and just open this up and preach the word of God to them, they hate it all. I'll tell you why. Like I told you two or three years ago, the world hates Christ. That's why. And the reason why they love that pagan tradition is because it's not of God. 
It's a devilish, wicked thing. And, and the history of it is seen from the Bible all the way through that you cannot, you cannot make symbols to worship Christ with. That's, by the way, that's even why I, I got rid of the cross pulpit I had up here. Honestly. I know that's not the same as a crucifix. I understand that. But I didn't really like it. I, didn't, I, didn't, I, I love the cross of Christ. And I'm glad he died for my sins on it. And I thank God for it. But you know what? I don't need a symbol like that to do anything with. I, I don't need it. We don't need it. Amen? We've got to be careful about things like that. Amen? We have to be cautious about things like that. You know? <clears throat> okay. All right, let me finish, then I'll let you do that. All right? Um, what's that? Okay, yep. All right, anyway, so um, think about those things. I, I'm, I think it'll help. Amen? I, I think it will. So uh, it, it gives you the history of it, and I, there's more that could be said. So much more about the evergreen, the worship, and you could really dig in deep into that stuff. But when you start getting into it, you have to talk about a lot of perverted things that I really have no desire to get into. Okay? It just gets it gets nasty. All right? What's that? The Masonic rituals that go along. There's a lot of things that I... Yep, yep. And, and I just, I, I don't want to talk about a lot of that stuff because it gets nasty. Brother Paul, you come on, come on. Pastor mentioned we have to be careful with these things. It's it. We laugh and joke about because it it's so ridiculous. Yep. But from the, the word of but from the word of God, for Ezekiel says, "Then said he unto me, then he, Jesus, he said unto me, Hast thou seen this? Well, we've seen this today. We've been shown this. We have seen this. The abominations of the heathen and the pagan. Yep. O son of man, turn thee, yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these." And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, right in the Lord's house, between the porch and the altar were about five and twenty men, and their backs turned, their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces, they were turned away from God, turned away from the house of God, and their faces toward the east, and they worshiped the sun toward the east. Yep. Those Christmas balls, symbols of the sun, yeah. sun worship, it's all the same thing. Right. Mm -hmm. Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which right. they commit here? Abominations. Right. For right. they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. Right. And lo, they put the branch to their nose. Yeah, the branch. It all goes back to that evergreen tree. Therefore, how is the Lord going to react to this? Will I also deal in fury? Yep. Fury. Mine eye shall not spare. Neither will I have pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet I will not hear them. This is serious yes, business. It is. It's serious business. Now... Will I shortly pour out my fury upon thee and accomplish mine anger upon thee? And I will judge thee according to thy ways and will recompense thee for all thine abominations, fury, anger, judgment, and payback for all the abominations, no mercy, no pity, payback. Then ye shall know that I am the Lord. There will be a reckoning. This is very serious serious stuff i'll tell you it's serious destruction cometh and they shall seek peace and there shall be none verse 25 destruction cometh and they shall seek peace there'll be many that say unto me on that day lord lord there will be many they're going to seek peace and there shall be none Brother Garrett and I, we just listened to that. The, God's three deadlines. Yep. You yes, sin sir. away your day of grace. Uh, it's all connected. This We learn not the way of the That's pagan. Right. Learn yeah. not the way of the heathen. We're to shun it. We're to fight against it. And we're to, I mean, we're to be out there. We're, we're the Lord Jesus' soldiers. So yeah. it's, it's serious business. And I know you all know that. But I just, I just saw that they put the branch to the nose. It's all connected that worship of that evergreen you know what's Amen. funny it's funny is i told you guys i think i don't know if i told brother nate and i think it was brother aaron 
um, and maybe a few others. I was driving back from Texas, and I told you I was going to preach a message on the image of Christmas, the image of jealousy, and talk about that. And that's exactly what you were talking about. That's the image of jealousy that provoked the Lord to anger. It provoked him to jealousy, and God hates it. God hates that paganism. It, pro- it, it provokes him to jealousy. It, it, it's in his people, okay? We're talking about God's people here when we say this, okay? We're not talking about the heathens. God already knows they're already heathen. It's about the people taking those customs, and it provokes the Lord to anger and jealousy. Think about that. Let's pray. Father, Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the truth of it. And thank you, Lord, that we have one mind and together here in this church. We come together, Lord, and we, we understand these things. You've given us that wisdom. We don't have it on our own, Lord. It's been given by you, and we thank you for that, Lord. We pray you'd bless us now, Lord, and bless this message, Lord, and bless the food that we're about to receive. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.